Hi, and welcome to the first MidPen Media Center Speaker Series event. This lecture series invites some of the outstanding artists and activists in our community to hold inspiring lectures and media making workshops. MidPen Media is a nonprofit community media center specializing in educational and accessible media making and civic engagement opportunities, including classes, local event coverage, and television studio rentals. We're located at 900 San Antonio Road in Palo Alto. Visit midpenmedia.org for more information. The following lecture is approximately two hours long and is hosted by Ray Rafa of the Video Arts Academy. And now presenting Sound Off, a sound design workshop for film and TV. This seminar will cover the audio aspects of amateur filmmaking. In this course, you'll learn about the importance of sound, how you can create better sound, and use many inexpensive tools to capture that sound. Now, if you're expecting some heavy hitter audio guy from Hollywood with tons of experience making movies like Cleopatra, frankly, you're in the wrong place, and if I were you, I'd ask for your money back. However, if you want to learn the practical aspects of amateur filmmaking with regard to sound, this is the right place. I have a lot of experience creating short films and videos. Video Arts Academy is a nonprofit organization consisting of over 450 volunteers with all different levels of skills and proficiencies. At the present time, Video Arts Academy is in a drug-induced coma because of COVID-19, and we won't become active until the pandemic is over. So with that said, let's get started. All of our seminars are produced by Video Arts Academy for the sole purpose of advancing amateur filmmaking through training and support. Here's a couple of assumptions we've made for you watching this course. Maybe you're just curious about how sound is captured in movie making and how it's used to make the story better. Or maybe you're an active filmmaker and you want to improve your sound skills or you work with other filmmakers and you want to improve the quality of your projects. Or maybe you're interested in creating podcasts or YouTube videos or maybe even training videos or just to improve the audio on Zoom. If any of these apply, this is the course for you. This seminar will show you the critical sound plays in films and other media. You will learn how to produce professional quality sound, music, and audio effects to enhance your project and to raise your production levels. First thing we're going to talk about is the importance of sound. Now, a lot of people take sound for granted, but as Martin Scorsese said one time, sound is more important than film. And it may not be more important, but it certainly is important. And you always want your sound quality to equal or exceed your video quality. We'll talk a little bit about the nature of sound. What is sound? How do we define sound? We'll talk about the job descriptions associated with catching sound for videos. Now, in a professional situation like Hollywood, you might have a staff of many people doing various, various aspects of capturing sound. Of course, with amateur filmmaking, you may have to you may have to wear more than one hat. So even though there's various job descriptions used in Hollywood, we can still use the vast experience that Hollywood has learned to better our sound performance. We'll also talk about what equipment you need to capture sound for video and how to acquire that equipment at the lowest possible cost. Then we'll talk about how it's done, how the actual recording is performed as far as signal flow and what hooks up to what. 
Then I'll, I'll, I'll share with you some real life examples of situations that I have had and workarounds that I've developed to make capturing sound easier. And then we'll do a wrap up and review what we've covered. So a little bit of history. Filmmaking has been around for about 125 years. Hollywood has learned a lot in that period. Even though you can never compete with the way Hollywood makes films and handles sound, you can capture and duplicate their procedures and apply them to even your little or no budget film. The first acknowledged true film was, was titled 1903 Great Train Robbery. This is what they called a two-reeler, meaning it consisted of two reels of film, each one about 18 to 20 minutes long. And in fact, in fact, the projector had to be stopped and reloaded with the second reel. So it had a built-in intermission. Now, even though this was called a silent film, it wasn't very long before filmmakers realized that by adding music to their silent films, they could tremendously enhance the viewing experience. In fact, one of the early uh, films that was made was simply a train traveling towards the camera, set up next to a train track. This was in the very early 1900s. People who viewed this were so shocked that they jumped out of their seats so that they wouldn't be hidden, hit by the train. Now, we've come a long way since that period. And in a sense, we're, we're sort of jaded in that we expect very high production levels. And for amateur filmmakers, it's sometimes hard to meet expectations. However, depending on the type of video you're making, the production levels can vary quite a bit. For example, um, let's say you wanted to go on YouTube and you found a video on how to load, how to, how to load a um, ink cartridge in your printer. So this may have been shot with a uh, cell phone and with a built-in microphone, but the production level would be fine. It's for your target. Your target, your viewer, simply wants to know how to change the cartridge. And on the other extreme, you have major motion pictures that spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars just on the audio. When you think about it, the word soundstage, Hollywood spent millions of dollars building these gigantic sound stages that weren't for the lighting. I mean, if you just were concerned about outdoor lighting, you could build a tent. No, it was to keep sound from entering the studio. That's how important it is to Hollywood. You know, 12 inch concrete walls and sound absorption material on all the surfaces. Now we like to think of Hollywood as the birth of motion pictures, but in fact, Niles Canyon in Fremont was the true Hollywood source from 1912 to 1916. 316 feature films were made in Niles Canyon. The Niles Canyon studios were partly owned by Charlie Chaplin that made four or five films there himself. So in the 1920s, um, talkies were developed. So true dialogue could be recorded either on film or a separate device that might be played back at the same time that the image was shown. And then in 1930s, silence are pretty well gone, and now we have uh, sound with, with the film. 1935, color film makes its first uh, presence. Uh, one of the first major, two major motion color films were Gone with the Wind and The Wizard of Oz. And in those days, they actually used three separate pieces of film running at the same time, one for red, one for blue, and one for green, and then sandwiched them together for the final product. In the 1950s, we had the big battle of TV versus Hollywood. More and more people were home watching TV and weren't going to movie theaters. In the 1960s, we graduated to color TV. And in the 1970s, 
you had cable TV, and that's when community sta TV stations were born. They were dictated by the FCC in order to get a license to establish a cable channel. Now, you've probably never heard of a director called Alan Smithy. He directed many projects between 1968 and 2000. He directed uh, a couple dozen major films and hundreds of television uh, series and motion pictures. And you might ask yourself, why did I never hear of Alan Smithy? Well, the fact is there is no Alan Smithy. Alan Smithy was created in a contract negotiation with either SAG or AFTRA, I can't remember which one. But it is a clause whereby if the director of a film doesn't like the results, he's unhappy with the results, and he doesn't want his name on it, he was allowed to put Alan Smithy as the director. So if you were to go online and look for movies directed by Alan Smithy, you'll see some really, really bad films, but you'll also see some pretty good films that actually be had, uh, became a cult following. So now I'd like to do an exercise. I'd like to close your eyes and listen to five 10 second audio clips and just try to visualize in your mind what you might expect to see on the screen and how the audio predetermines your emotion as you watch the video. So hopefully you saw how the sound can affect the emotion and how you can use it to your advantage to match what's on your screen, to get your viewer in a certain emotional situation as you present the film. All right, let's talk about some common sound issues. Sound in, in amateur filmmaking is often neglected. We get so hung up with uh, shooting 2K, 4K, 16K, shooting with a red, shooting with prime lenses, the lighting, and on and on and on. And often audio is, is an afterthought, and that's totally wrong. Your audio and the effort you put into it should be equal to the effort you put into the video. Audio in filmmaking is rarely exploited. There is so much you can do with audio that amateur filmmakers are not doing, and we'll get into that a little deeper later on. Audio can put half of your movie at risk. If you have bad audio, you have just bought a one-way train ticket to Stinktown. There's nothing you can do. If you have distorted audio, there's no magical software that's going to fix it. It's just bad audio. Audio can lower your production costs. I'll give you an example. Um, a movie maker friend of mine in New York was shooting a low budget horror film and he had a particular key scene whereby the villain, a surgeon, was actually going to remove the kidney from a girl strapped on a table. Um, now you can imagine trying to do this with special effects, creating a, a false belly out of uh, 
latex and all that would be extremely expensive. So what we came up with is a workaround whereby in the actual movie, from, from the girl's point of view, she looks up and she sees the surgeon with a scalpel in his hands and the scalpel moves towards the girl. The next shot is a side shot showing the side of her body with her arm strapped down and you hear this tremendous scream and you see blood dripping down the side of her chest. Now that of course was a very easy shot to shoot and it got the point across and there's many many situations that you can do this. Another good example is the movie Shawshank Redemption. If you ever saw this movie if you recall at the end towards the end of the movie the warden shoots himself. He puts a gun in his mouth and pulls the trigger. But you never saw him shoot himself. What you saw was him putting the gun in his mouth and then the next scene was the wall behind him. You heard the gunshot and then blood splatter on the back of the wall. These are workarounds whereby you can imply something without spending a lot of money and improve the production value of your project. You can create a more emotional impact. You can direct the viewer. You can lead them to a certain emotional state by simply using the background music or sound effects. And you can also trick the audience. You can lull them into a uh, calm situation and then bam, hit them over the head with sound. It can aid in continuity. Uh, if you know video editing, you know J-cuts and L-cuts where the audio may precede or lag the video and you can actually create continuity jumps using the sound by carrying the sound over to the next to the next scene. And of course you can manipulate or fool your viewer by using certain sounds creating curiosity, scaring them, and so forth. And you can help tell the story. You can introduce sounds at the beginning of a project and later on you can use those same sounds to introduce a character back on screen before you even show the character. This is used quite often in Hollywood. So let's talk about what is sound. Sound as a concept, if I like to think of a film project or video project as the picture being information and the sound being the emotion. Of course, besides, besides the dialogue. But one of the things that makes sound so important is if you consider how the human body handles picture and sound. When we view something on screen, we have to go through many, many steps before the brain figures out what's going on. For example, you actually see upside down. So the brain has to flip it right side up, it has to focus, it has to adjust the iris for the brightness, it has to eliminate parallax, it has to look for shapes and compare those with known shapes, look for motion, and on and on and on. So a brief glimpse at a video image doesn't give you a lot of information. Sound, on the other hand, is very, very direct. Sound enters the ear, is converted to an electrical signal, and it goes directly to the brain. Your brain figures out which direction it's coming from, and the brain and the hearing system is actually optimized probably through, um, through history to certain sounds. For example, we are very, very sensitive to a baby crying. And maybe that's something that uh, evolved with man. Sound is messy. Sound bounces all over the place. It's very difficult to block. It's difficult to control. And it's very easy to capture sound, but it's difficult to capture the sound you want and the sounds you don't want. Sound contains high energy. Whales converse with sound over hundreds of miles. Compared to light, you can block light with a simple piece of paper, 
but sound might, re might require a 12 inch thick concrete wall. Sound has an incredible dynamic range. As we'll learn quickly, sound is measured in a unit called decibels. And the ratio of sound from a whisper to, to uh, a jet taking off is something like a million to one. Your hearing automatically adapts and adjusts the response to sound based on its volume. Sound is difficult to capture. It's difficult to capture the sound you want and not capture the sound you don't want. So when we talk about the nature of sound, sound has two aspects. It has a frequency or pitch, and it's measured in cycles per second in the old days. Now it's called hertz. It also has amplitude or volume. Sound is affected by reflection, and that is called reverberation or echo. And it is a reflection of all frequencies for example, if you're standing in a tile, all tile bathroom and singing, you know how much reverberation you get. Imagine trying to record in that situation. You also have a, a phenomenon called harmonics, which are even multiples or fractions of a primary frequency. So if you had a frequency of 1,000 hertz, you would have harmon harmonics at 500 hertz, 250, and 2,000 and 4,000. Um, and sometimes this plays a part in our ability to capture sound. So now I'm going to play a couple examples of different frequencies so you can better identify sound. Here's 50 hertz. Now I know those at home probably didn't hear the upper and lower ranges and that's due to the bandwidth and uh, techniques we use in creating these videos. So we measure sound in what's called decibels. And decibels are a fraction of a unit of measure called Bell. And Bell was named after Alexander Graham Bell. That's when sound became important when he developed the, the uh, telephone. So decibels are one-tenth of a bell, and there's two ways that you will see decibel uh, values. One is in the physical world. In the physical world, zero dB is the average threshold of hearing, meaning most people can hear a sound if it is above zero dB. And this is the important part that you need to remember. If you take any signal and you reduce it by 6 dB, it cuts the gain or the volume of the sound in half. If you double it by adding 6 dB, you double that value. For example, if I had a signal at 1,000 hertz at 20 dB and I increased it to 26 dB, it would double that sound. This will be uh, become important later on when we talked about when we talk about recording equipment. So here's some examples, real world examples of dB levels. A whisper is at 35 dB. Normal speech that you would find in a house would be 65 dB. Traffic out, you know, in front of a traffic light with uh, Lots of cars moving back and forth is roughly about 80 dB, 85 dB. Some rock concerts could be 115 dB, which is really not good for you. And there's probably not a lot of you out there, but a lot of you that grew up in the 60s, your ears are probably still ringing. The, the, the damage threshold in dB is generally thought to be about 101, 121 dB. Anything above 121 dB for any length of time can seriously damage your hearing. 
If you were standing next to a jet taking off, that's 135 dB. And the one of interest to me is a gunshot at 145 dB, which brings up another story. In 61, that's 1961 for your youngsters, I was awarded a two-year all-expenses-paid vacation by the U.S. government. Some people called it being drafted. So during this two-year vacation, I was taught how to fire a rifle. Now, in those days, you were not allowed to wear any ear protection. But, of course, the sergeants and the officers, they all had earplugs. And I think the reason you couldn't wear ear protection is they wanted you to hear clearly the verbal, verbal abuse that they would be yelling at us during this time period. Now, I don't notice that the gunshot is at 145 dB, but the damage threshold is 121 dB. And what this means is virtually everybody that went through basic training had ringing ears, some for a few hours, some for a few days, some for a few months. So I have ringing ears now in my old age, and who knows, it's probably the Army's fault. So again, I want to emphasize this. Reducing any signal by 6 dB cuts the signal in half. Increasing any signal by 6 dB doubles the sound. That's true in the electronic world, and it's true in the physical world. So when we're handling audio and we're recording audio for projects, we think of 0 dB as the absolute maximum a signal should ever reach. Anything over 0 dB is going to be distorted. And if it is distorted, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. You can reduce the volume or gain in your editor, but it is still distorted. So in order to make sure that we never exceed the 0 dB, we usually purposely record 6 to 12 dB below zero to make absolutely sure that we never reach the zero threshold. So here's a couple of examples that, of meters that you might see on a recorder. And notice that zero, anything above zero is red, meaning danger, danger. Uh, whether it's digital or analog, it's the same thing. If you reach the red, if it, just, if it just touches the red, you're probably okay. But if it's continuously in red, that audio is no good and it's not going to be usable. You need to retake it. So let's talk a little bit about the various job descriptions that you might see in Hollywood but can still apply on an amateur filmmaking basis. Okay, the first job we're going to talk about, it's called the location sound mixer, but really it's the sound guy or girl. That's the person responsible for capturing dialogue on your project. Now in many cases, you may have to operate the boom and operate a recorder or a mixer or what have you at the same time. This can be done, but it becomes difficult because if you need to adjust the gain, let's say the actor is starting to talk louder and louder or softer and softer, you need to be able to reach the gain control knob on your recorder or your mixer, but how do you do that where you're holding a boom pole? So that's a problem. So it's most common, if it's possible, to have a separate boom pole operator and a separate recorder. Now, if you really want the best out of your project, and you are the sound person, you need to get involved early on in the project. And this is where you may have a script and you'll do things like table read or readings. And it's nice if you as a sound person can be there and you can analyze the actors, the volumes they're talking about, and look out for any extremes, like if there's going to be a a gunshot or, or anything and plan ahead so when you're recording the audio you know when that event is coming and you've planned ahead. You need to determine the audio workflow. Where's the microphone going to go? Uh, are the actors moving? Do we need to use wireless or a separate recorder? 
Uh, is there going to be a place on the set for me to hide a microphone? You need to scout the locations. This can be important. I had a situation once where I scouted a, an apartment during the day. I think it was a Wednesday afternoon, but the shoot was Friday night. What I didn't know is there was some sort of social club downstairs that had loud, loud rock and roll music, and it was impossible to do the shoot. So that was, that was my bad. I should have scouted that location at the same day and time that the shoot was going to take place and I would have caught that. And you'll also need to determine your equipment needs. What is going to be your sound pattern? Are you going to use a recorder? Are you going to record directly to the camera? Do you need multiple microphones, boom pole, and so forth? You need to know all of this before you head to the shoot, so you're absolutely sure you have everything you need. And once you have all this information, if there's a storyboard in this project or shot list, you need you might want to put notations on the shot list or storyboard to remind you of certain situations where you have to make changes to your audio capture. So your main goal as a sound person, person is to capture clean, unadulterated dialogue. What I mean by that is flat dialogue without any enhancements with your um, mixer. Don't boost the, um, the bass to make it sound better or, or whatever. All that should be done in post. The only exception is Sometimes you want, if you have a mixer, you might want to turn down the low frequency gain to minimize any sounds you can't control, like a refrigerator or um, heating system or outside noise. That's, that's the only exception. Another thing you'll be responsible for is, is, is termed capture room tone. All rooms and environments have a background sound to them. It may be very low, it may be very high, but in order to have all the tools you need when you go to edit, you need to have room tone, straight room tone without any other sounds. And the reason you need this is, let's say you're, you're on a shoot and you're shooting in an apartment and somebody bangs on the front door. And of course, that's going to be recorded. Now, in post, it's very easy to cut that door pounding out of your audio clip. But when you play it back, your room tone will be missing. And, and you will see, you will hear a dead spot. So in a situation like that, you need a portion of room tone to patch in to that segment that you removed. You need to capture um, uh, sync points for audio effects. For example, um, one thing that comes to mind is actually recording the sound of a car door closing is almost impossible to make it sound true. It just doesn't work. But if the camera sees the door being closed, Later on in post, you can add a sound effect of a door closing, and this is used more than, more than you might think. You also need to record sync points. For example, let's say you were shooting a video where someone fires a gun as part of the story. What you would want your actor to do, if they don't have a prop pistol, which actually fires a little plastic ball forward, you would want them to jerk their hand backwards just like it would with the recoil of a real gun and that will be your sync point when you see that in video that's when you insert your gunshot and of course you may be single-handed so you need to hold the boom and you need to hold it correctly so you don't tire yourself out on a long shoot, if you don't hold the boom correctly, as we will show you in the demonstration period, you're going to get awfully tired. 
So, as a location sound mixer, using your toolkit of equipment and skills, your job is to solve problems as they come up and capture the best, cleanest, uncolored dialogue and other sounds that you may need at the highest audio levels without distortion or noise. That is your number one job. So let's talk a little bit about the boom operator. Hopefully this is a second person and not you responsible for holding the boom and recording the audio at the same time. So your job is to hold or place a microphone as directed by the location sound mixer and the director. And a very common technique is the director or DP will have you lower the microphone closer and closer and closer to the mouth of your of your actor until he sees the microphone in the camera frame and then he'll say okay back it off and you slowly back it off till you're just out of the frame so now you are as close as you as close as possible to the sound source without being in the clip Also, uh, boom operators are, are commonly tasked with managing and setting up different microphones and cabling uh, as you change locations and different sets, making sure that these cabling that are running on the floor are well secured so no one trips, and swapping out microphones and batteries and so forth. You'll probably also be responsible for micing up the talent, meaning if it's a hidden microphone or even if it's a lav mic, it would be hooking the microphone up to the up to the talent in the proper position, running the cable uh, under a shirt to a uh, um, to an XLR cable or a box and, and so forth. That's usually also your responsibility on location. Another thing you may have to do if you're single-handed is if you know, for example, that in a certain scene there's going to be a very loud sound excursion, like a pistol or a shriek or whatever, and you have no other way of handling it, you may have to actually lower the gain just before the sound excursion so you don't overload and distort by going above 0 dB. Now, in Hollywood, there's a whole separate department called sound design. These people are responsible for taking the raw audio from the location sound mixer and combining it with pre-edited video and adding the dialogue, sound effects, music, and so forth, and putting it all together. So one of their tasks is to synchronize the audio and the video. Obviously, if a gun fires in the video, the audio sound soundtrack needs, needs to meet that. Another main task is to modify and edit the dialogue, the audio. And that may mean <coughs> modifying the audio as far as frequency response, adjusting the levels, enhancing certain parts. It may be coloring the audio for visual effect. For example, uh, if you've ever watched a movie where the actor looks up and rolls his eyes and you hear dialogue, but it has very strong reverb, then you know he's thinking it. And that's the kind of thing that a sound designer would do. He needs to insert sound effects to match the screen. There are literally hundreds of thousands of sound, eff sound effect clips available on the inter internet and most are free. And these sound clips are professionally recorded and the, the majority of them are far better than any that you might come up with on the set. So hardly anybody actually records a sound effect anymore. They simply use 
a pre-existing library. And of course, you want to add music for most productions. And when I say music, it could be a complete song, like for the introduction of a movie, or a complete song when you play the credits. It's very rare that you would play a complete song piece uh, within a movie. More likely, you're, you're simply going to play a few bars to add emotion to the effect or an introduction. And then you're going to perform the final mix. This is where you bring everything together. You bring the cleaned up dialogue that's already synced with the video. You adjust the mix between the dialogue, background music, and sound effects, and so forth. Uh, you may set different channels for stereo or THX 5.1 and so forth. This is all done in the final mix. The final mix is the final video audio product. Another thing that depending on what you're shooting, it's a nice thing to keep in mind if you're going to serve as a sound designer is to reserve an audio track in your video, a blank track with nothing on it for translation or dubbing. You never know where your project may go. And the last thing you want to do is have a beautiful project that someone wants to watch in a different language, but you can't do that without seriously affecting your final mix because you're in your final mix, you embedded your dialogue with all your other channels. So it's a very good idea to simply reserve a separate track for translation. So it's built into the project. Use it or not use it at your discretion. Another common thing that's done nowadays with amateur filmmaking is to put all of your music on a separate track for safety. And the reason you do that is, for example, on YouTube, YouTube has a computer that looks at music on every YouTube posted. And how it does it, I have no idea. But it looks to see if that music is in its library and copyrighted. And it does a pretty good job. It screws up every now and then, but most of the time it's pretty accurate. So if you intentionally or accidentally embedded a copyrighted song into your YouTube project, YouTube will detect that and it'll come back and say, uh-uh, you cannot post this video because you have copyrighted music. So one of the things that's a good idea to do is to put your music on a totally separate track. So if need be, you could either remove the music or remove the music and add music that you know is not copyrighted and save your project. So let's do a quick recap. Sound is important. It's far more important than most people think. Enhancing the sound part of your project can tremendously improve the production value of your project. And remember, you never know where your project may go, so always try to get the highest production level you can. We talked about the nature of sound. What is sound? Frequency and levels. We talked a little bit about some sound examples and workarounds that you can use to save money in your production and to imply the effect you want. There's an old saying, don't say it, show it. I have another saying, don't show it, imply it. And then we also showed you some sound examples whereby just a few seconds of audio and you can actually come back and say, oh yeah, that was from such and such a movie. And that shows you how easy it is to embed that information with just a, a second or two of sound, but it's very difficult to do that with video. So that shows you how important sound is and what you can do with the sound. And then we also talked about the different roles of people involved in capturing sound, 
the location sound mixer. I don't even know why it has that name now. That's from the old days. But essentially, it's, uh, you know, it's the sound guy or sound girl. Now let's talk about the hardware that's used in capturing sound. First, we'll talk about microphones and microphone accessories. There are basically only a few different types of microphones, and they're classified on how they work, the mechanics of it. Now, microphones are a lot like hammers. You can buy a hammer to break up concrete, or you could buy a little tack hammer. Microphones are similar in a sense that microphones are designed to perform different audio tasks. And your job is to match the right tool to the job. So microphones can be classified into basically two types. One is dynamic, and I'll show you examples of these different microphones later in the demonstration period. Dynamic microphones are actually mechanical. They have a diaphragm and a coil, and when you speak into it, the coil generates a small electrical signal that is used to record the audio. There are both large capsule and small capsule dynamic microphones. This simply refers to the size of this disc, and that affects the sensitivity. All other microphones are what we call electronic, or sometimes called condenser or electret, and they all mean the same thing. They are electronic in nature. There is circuitry inside the microphone, and they require power. Also, because they require power and have circuitry, they're very, very sensitive, but they're also very fragile. You can drop a microphone one time and ruin it very easily. So when we look at different microphones and how they can be applied to different situations, there's a few things we want to consider. One is the pickup pattern. How wide a pattern is it? Do I need to collect sound from an entire choir? Or do I need to pick up the dialogue of a single person in a party situation? Sensitivity. I need a microphone that's sense enough to pick up a signal that's strong enough to record at the distance I'm going to be recording. If the mic isn't sensitive enough, I may not be able to get close enough to the source to record a signal, a clean signal. The other is size. Does the microphone need to be hidden or can it be shown? And the last thing to consider is power requirements. Electric or condenser microphones, since they have electronics in them, they need power. You need to supply that power. That power can be either external, and it would be called um, phantom power, or the microphone may have a battery inside it that you need to turn on. So here's one of my favorite microphones. This is a Boya BYM1. And what is unique about this microphone is the tremendous value but also the performance, the, the response, the, the frequency response of this microphone is incredible if you consider using it for dialogue. It doesn't have a real wide frequency response, uh, but you don't want a wide frequency response if you're recording dialogue. When the telephone company was, was put together, they analyzed voice and decided that the system must handle frequencies between 350 and about 3500 hertz. And this covers normal dialogue. You do not want to pick up anything above or below that because it could be noise. What's interesting about this microphone is if you look at the termination, it has what's called a TRRS uh, eighth inch plug. That TRRS has four connections on it, and it is designed to plug directly into a cell phone or recorder. Now, you cannot just plug any microphone into a cell phone or recorder. The, the termination may not be the same, and most likely it won't work. 
So in order to use something with a cell phone, you need this four, conduct four conductor TRRS cable. In the center, you have that small block with a uh, belt clip. Inside that is an internal battery. So we can use this microphone with external phantom power, or you can use the internal battery. It's got a little on-off switch, which means this, this microphone with the right cable adapters is going to work for virtually any situation you may have. Now the microphone itself is a little bit large, so there may be some situations where it might be hard to hire to um, hide the microphone, but in most cases uh, it can be easily done. As an added bonus, it's got a 20 foot long cord between the microphone and the switch. And this gives you the ability to mic up uh, uh, your talent and they can actually walk around with some mobility with that 20 foot cord and all this for under fifteen dollars. I use these all the time. Now if you look at conventional um, lavalier or lav mics, they range anywhere from thirty to five hundred to thousand dollars. They are performance wise, they're of course a little better than the than the previous one but they're also extremely fragile. And the biggest problem is on the real tiny ones, that connection between the microphone and the cord itself is the weak point. If you have talent that's hooked up to a microphone like this and they're plugged in a cable and then they forget that they're hooked up and they stand up and walk away and pull the cable out of the microphone, you're, you're pretty well out of, you're out of it because these microphones can't be repaired and you may have paid $500 to $1,000 for that microphone. So you need to be careful. The other thing to consider is uh, all these microphones come with a little windshield. Always keep that windshield on the microphone even if you're not going to use it during the shoot because it acts as a, as a uh, cushion. If you were to drop the microphone, you've got a better chance of not damaging it with the windshield on it. These are what we call plant mics or instrument mics, and these are micro, they're called plant mics because they're typically used to hide in a plant. For example, a restaurant situation where you have a couple with dialogue and maybe there's a plant on the table, you, you might hook one of these up pointed at the two actors to, to capture the dialogue. These are electric microphones, so they uh, professional electric microphones always require phantom power. Uh, there's no batteries in them, so you have to supply power from your recorder or your mixer. And here's the ubiquitous shotgun microphone, which in, in my opinion is highly overrated and highly overused. Shotgun microphones are commonly used outdoors, and the whole idea is to be able to capture, to pull dialogue out of a noisy situation, and, and they do work to some degree. On the screen here, here you see a naked shotgun, and on the screen you also see a shotgun w with a cover, it's called a Zeppelin, because it resembles a blimp, that might have a, um, a, a uh, cloth or a fuzzy cover that's called a dead cat, and that is to uh, minimize wind. Uh, and these can get quite expensive. If you're going to do studio work, for example, if you're going to do voiceovers or make YouTube videos or instructional videos, you'll probably want to use a studio mic. These are fairly inexpensive. Again, they're electronic microphones, so they're going to need power. Most of them are designed to plug into your directly into your computer with a USB connector and to simply sit on your desk. Now, when we talk about microphones, one of the things we're concerned with is the pickup pattern, and that is the direction at which it will capture sound. Now, on the left, you see the shotgun microphone, and those lines indicate the narrowness, narrowness of the uh, capture and where it is most sensitive to sound. So if you look at the red, that is high frequency, meaning that directly ahead of the microphone 
it will capture audio very well, but not much from the sides. But as you go down lower and lower in frequency, it will actually pick up more in the sides, which you usually don't want. Another pickup pattern is called Omni or Omnidirectional, and it essentially picks up sound in all directions. And this is the most uh, common that's used for lav mics. Or the cardioid is also used for lav mics, and this has like a heart-shaped pattern where it picks up sound from the front much better than from the back. So you need to know your shooting situation in order to make an intelligent decision on which microphone to use. So when you're using a shotgun microphone, you want to aim the side of the microphone or the null, the side that doesn't capture sound well, at a noise source if possible. So let's say for example you're shooting out in a park and you're shooting a bench scene and there is a gardener with a mower mowing the lawn off to your left. Well of course you want to aim the shotgun microphone directly at your talent but what you also want to do is arrange the microphone in a situation such that the side of the shotgun microphone is facing the noise source to minimize picking up that noise source. Another thing that you should use as a rule of thumb is however many audio channels you have available when you record audio is to use them all. There's no reason not to. So even if you're shooting with a DSLR camera, I would still use the built-in microphone in the camera. Even though I'm using a separate recorder, maybe two or three other channels, but always record a channel because there's no reason not to, because you never know what may come up. And you may reach a situation where you your audio is unusable from your primary source, and you may have to use that crummy audio that was recorded by your DSLR because that's all you have. Another trick that I use all the time is, uh, I, later on I'm going to show you a famous uh, audio recorder called a Zoom H4, which is probably the most used recorder in amateur filmmaking. And it has two input channels for external mics. And I have a, uh, a cable that I attach to the H4. It takes the output from the microphone and splits it into two inputs. Now on those two inputs, I'll set one input to say 6 dB or 10 dB below zero. And that is my main channel. But I'll set the other channel to maybe 20 dB below zero. Now in normal recording, my regular channel is going to be nice and loud. My safety channel is going to be a bit hard to hear. But let's say there's a gunshot or somebody screams on my primary channel. I'm going to peek out and it's going to distort, but on my secondary channel it's usable because I recorded it uh, 12 dB below zero. So that's another way you can protect yourself to get good audio and not be surprised. So always use all the channels that are available to you. And here's another tip that I learned the hard way. If you're shooting in an indoor situation like a kitchen, and the refrigerator is running, you need to shut the refrigerator off, which is simply turn a dial inside, but always put your car keys <laughs> inside the refrigerator so you don't forget. I'm speaking from experience. I had to buy a lot of food. All right, another type of microphone that's commonly overused is the wireless, and these can range from low, low cost to, to thousands of dollars. And what they do is the transmitter is worn by the talent and a microphone is placed on the talent, usually hidden. It transmits the audio to a receiver that would be located at your position as the location sound mixer, maybe on the camera or maybe on the mixer and feeds directly into that device. Now these are always problematic in that there's always the possibility of interference. You can get interference from cell phone towers. 
You can actually get a lot of interference from modern day traffic lights that actually talk to each other with radio signals. Military bases, marine radio, go on, it goes on and on and on. So I would use wireless as my last resort. My preferred method is to use uh, an old cell phone that I have that I've upgraded and simply plug my microphone into the cell phone and bring up an audio recording program, hit record, adjust the volume if necessary, and simply have the talent hide it on their body or put it in their back pocket. This gives you very, very clean audio. It'll record for, for an hour or two, and you can usually hide the mic so you don't have to worry so much about uh, wind noise. And I'll show you an example coming up in a couple of minutes how that can work to your advantage. And essentially, most people have old cell phones, so here's a freebie. It's a recorder and it replaces a wireless. So headphones are important. You need a good set of headphones. You have to hear exactly what's being recorded and you have to blank out all exterior noise. You don't want to hear any traffic. You don't want to hear anything other than the pure audio that's being recorded. So you know you need a good set of headphones. This is something that I use exclusively now that I'll show you and I'll show you all the features in the demonstration portion. Um, so uh, I'll leave it to that part. Recording devices. You need some way to record the audio. Now we just talked about one way you could use an old cell phone. Another way is to use a separate recording device. In this case we have a um, Zoom H4 which is used by many many filmmakers. Uh, on the top you have a, I believe that's sound design, that is a field mixer that records uh, digitally to an SD card. That probably costs around $3,000. They're very expensive. And as, I, as we just covered, you can use an old cell phone or you can use an external recorder and in some cases it's both a mixer and a recorder. It's a mixer in that it accepts uh, multiple channels and you can selectively adjust the gain of each channel and then also records it on a uh, SD card. So mixing devices. If you're going to be recording more than one or two channels, you are going to need a device to combine all these channels into your recording channels and this is called a mixer. Now mixers are fairly inexpensive. This Behringer is a mixer I use quite often because it will run off um, 110 volts but also it's battery powered so I can use it in the field. And this is a six channel mixer so I can import uh, or I can input six different channels. It has phantom power so I can supply power to microphones that need it. I do have a little bit of adjustment of the color of the sound. I can cut the lows so that wind isn't picked up as much. It has headphone output that I can adjust separately so I can adjust the sound level in my headphones for, for best monitoring. Cabling and connectors. There are basically two types of connectors and cables used in the audio function of filmmaking and that is what, what they call TRS and XLR. XLR is the three pin on the bottom. I won't go into the technical part but XLR cables are pretty much pretty much the standard for professional audio equipment. They have the capability of canceling out self-induced noise so even long runs of these cables won't pick up um, RF interference or AC interference so they're they're pretty rugged and they're very good performance against noise. That silly looking device up in the corner, I don't remember the name of it, but it's used on many devices including the zoom recorder. It will accept either a quarter inch uh, TRS jack or an XLR. Either one will plug directly into this connector. So 
I mentioned earlier about power sources. There are some microphones that require power. And this power has to be either supplied by an internal battery within the microphone or externally with what they call phantom power. And phantom power will cr come from your either your mixer or your recording device. It will send power to the microphone to power the electronics. Or your microphone may have provision for installing a battery and use that battery in lieu of phantom power. Now some microphones can be damaged by connecting phantom power to a microphone that expects battery power. It's rare, but it can happen. So always know what type of microphone you have and whether or not it can be damaged by phantom power. A Behringer cable tester. This is, after buying headphones, this is the next device I would buy. I would not be caught dead trying to shoot without one of these devices. Now I'll demonstrate it in the demonstration portion of the seminar, but let me basically tell you what it does. Its primary function is to test cables. And one of the problems, one of the biggest problems with capturing audio is cables get broken and shorted and so forth. They get banged around, stepped on. So you need an easy way to check those cables. What a cable tester does is you take a cable that you want to check out and you plug it to the in and out on this little box and you press a button and it will analyze that cable and tell you if it's open or shorted or intermittent. So then you know your cable is good. Another thing it does is it, it will output a 0 dB level signal at 400 hertz or 1000 hertz. This comes in real handy if you have a complex situation where the microphone uh, is on a stage and it goes through a soundboard and then a recorder and then to a camera. I mean, it's difficult enough to set something like this up, but the last thing you want to do is have someone standing at that microphone saying, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? As everyone else is trying to figure out the cabling to get this thing working. What this does is it sends out a signal, a reference signal at 0 dB. So I can connect that signal where the microphone would be and then at the first termination, let's say it's a mixer, I can monitor do I hear that signal. And if I do hear that signal, I can set the gain of my mixer to 0 dB. So now my mixer is calibrated. Now say the next step is a recorder. So I plug it into my recorder in the monitor. Do I hear my tone? No. Okay, then I have a fault between the mixer and the recorder. If I do hear it, I set my recorder gain at 0 dB. Now my recorder is calibrated. And then you may, not, you may end up putting a track all the way to the camcorder. Can I hear it at the camcorder? If I do, I set it to 0 dB. Now, all devices in the chain are calibrated. So I know that I've, if I never ex exceed 0 dB at the mixer, I'm never going to exceed 0 dB anywhere else. Another function uh, that it has is, let's say you want to test your headphones. Are your headphones working? Well, simply plug them into this box and turn on the tone and see if you hear the tone. So that's what it can do, and in a situation where you have a faulty cable or microphone or headphones, it can be a lifesaver, and I believe they sell under $30. This is the functions as recap. If we, we, can, we can provide a tone to set up your audio path and levels. We can test cables that are suspect for problems. It'll also indicate if you have phantom power coming out of your mixer or your recorder, because if your microphone needs phantom power and it's not there, your microphone's not gonna work. Simply plug your cable into this device, and if it has phantom power present, it will light up. And you can also test your headphones. This is something I strongly recommend. It's no longer in print, but this is an extremely useful and informative book, Producing Great Sound for Film and Video. 
it's still available on Amazon, and I think the last copy I bought as a gift was five or six dollars. It's written by Jay Rose, who's a excellent location sound mixer and really knows his stuff. I highly uh, recommend this book. So other things that you're going to need that I will also demonstrate in the demo portion of the seminar is you need a boom pole to hold the microphone. You're going to need expendables, which would be oh gaffer tape that you tape down cables so people don't uh, trip over them. You're going to need batteries for all your equipment and maybe your microphones. Of course, recording media for your recorder. Um, you may need a USB interface if you're going to be using a studio type mic in other situations. Also very handy are sound blankets that you can use to, to um, shield against external sounds that you can't control. They're called sound blankets, but really they're moving blankets that you can buy or rent from U-Haul. They all do the same thing, they absorb sound. So here's a boom pole and here's what to look for. Um, the boom pole I use has a built-in cable because one of the problems when you're using a boom pole is like in a windy situation, if the cable is wrapped around the boom pole, wind can slap it against the pole and you'll actually hear it. On this type of pole, it, uh, the cable is built in so you don't have that problem. This particular one I use I think extends to 12 feet. All right, so we've talked about the importance of sound and how you can improve your sound capturing abilities. Now let's talk about hardware that you need to collect sound. And I'm going to mainly focus on fairly low cost uh, equipment and techniques because most amateur filmmakers don't have a, a large budget. So the first thing you're gonna need when you start working in the world of audio is a good set of headphones. And if you go on the internet and look at reviews and, and all the different features, it gets very, very confusing. So here's my favorite headphones. I've had lots of different headphones, some very expensive, but I've never found a set of headphones that has so many features at such a low cost. These particular headphones are very sensitive, and when you research headphones on the internet, you'll see all sorts of numbers as, as sensitivity and so forth that, that really don't mean a lot unless you understand the, the world of electronics. These are from Amazon. They're fairly inexpensive, less than $30. But these headphones are extremely sensitive, and what that means is that if you're in a noisy situation, you can easily hear what's going on from the camera or your recorder. Now, the main features of this set of headphones is, first of all, it seems like such a little thing, but notice how the earphones reverse, which means I can do this. I can hold it up to my ear to listen to playback without having to put the headphones on. The other thing is they are foldable, if you know what you're doing. So they're very compact. They go in a bag, which is nice. But probably the most, the, the most important feature of these headphones is that they come with a special cord that has two connectors on it. One is a what we call an eighth inch TRS, and one is a quarter inch TRS. Now, when headphones go bad, what usually goes bad is the cable. What happens is you're wearing the headphones and you turn away and it pulls, pulls on the cord. These are detachable, which is a nice feature. But the other nice feature, I don't know if you can see it, but here you have two outputs. One is a quarter inch. TRS, and the other is an eighth inch TRS. The cord that comes with it has both a quarter and an eighth. And what that means is this will virtually plug into any piece of audio equipment 
because it's either going to have a quarter inch, a quarter inch, or an eighth inch. Also, the cord is easily replaceable and inexpensive. And one of the best features is these are very comfortable, and because of the foam, it blocks out all exterior sound. So when you're recording audio, you want to hear exactly what the recorder hears. You don't want to hear any outside noise. So these are, uh, these are a tremendous asset. This is probably the first item, if you're getting into this, that you want to buy. And we, before we go on, I want to talk about a uh, serious problem with amateur filmmakers. It's a, um, it's a disease called gas gear acquisition syndrome. And what that means is as you start your career, you start buying more and more gear, gear acquisition. And a lot of times you'll end up buying gear far more expensive than you really need. So hopefully with this course and these demonstrations, I'll show you some alternatives to the so-called standard equipment that amateur filmmakers use. One of the things you have to consider when you're making YouTubes or short films or virtually any project is you want to consider production level. And what I mean by production level is you want the quality of your audio and the quality of your video to match what you're trying to do and your audience. For example, if it's a if it's a YouTube on how to change a cartridge in a printer, no one expects super high quality audio or video. It's there for information. On the other hand, if you're shooting Gone with the Wind, your, your production levels are extremely high. So you have to find a balance, and when you start acquiring equipment, you want to just exceed what you need for your production values. Now the next thing I want to show you is, this is a, a real time saver. It's, a, it's called a cable tester, but it does so much more. Now as we talked about earlier, about different connectors, there are various different connectors used in, in audio when, when you talk about making films. One of the most common is XLR. And here we have a male and a female. What I do with this is, in the field, one of the problems you have is sometimes cables go bad. This device is used to check a cable. I plug in my cable, the male and female, and simply turn it on and press this button. Oops. And it will tell me here if the cable is good, if it's open, or if it's shorted, or if I move the connector around, if it's intermittent. And it will handle XLR, quarter inch TRS, MIDI cables, RCA, and even uh, quarter inch or eighth inch TRS. So this is very handy to have. It costs, I think, under $30. The second thing it does, and the thing I use the most, is it produces a tone. A 400 or 1000 hertz tone. Now, when you're setting up to shoot audio, many times it can be quite complex depending how you're shooting as far as the audio feed from the microphone all the way to the recorder and or the camera. So normally what you do, you hook up a microphone and wherever the next thing is, whether it's a mixer recorder, hopefully you can hear it there and then go all the way to the camera to see if you can hear it there. What this does is instead of plugging the microphone in at the end where the microphone would go, I plug this device and I send a tone for the microphone and let's say it goes to a mixer. At the mixer, I can adjust the gain to zero dB. So now the mixer is calibrated to my sound source. Then I go to the recorder, zero dB. Then I go to the camera zero dB. Now the entire audio chain is calibrated. So you can make adjustments without the risk of distorting because all of your uh, items in the chain are set to zero dB. 
So this is something I cer certainly recommend. The other thing it's useful for is if you want to test headphones. I can plug in my headphones. Do I hear the tone? Do I hear it on both sides? That tests your headphones. Now, before we talk about microphones, let's go to the recorders. And if you're not recording on the camcorder, uh, and hopefully not, because that's not the best way to go, you're probably going to use a separate recorder to record your audio. Now, I'm going to show you two different, actually three different recorders. The first is a one channel. This is a device made by Zoom. You can use, uh, actually it's two channel. It has two built-in stereo microphones and it will also accept one external microphone. So you can simply have a lav microphone as I have here, plugged into the recorder, hit record, set the gain, and you're ready to go. And also, if you think about it, if you're in a situation, let's say you're on a beach, and it's really windy, uh, you can't use other microphones because the wind is so strong. But what you can do, like we showed on the video earlier about hiding the lav mic, is plug it into this and simply put it in your back pocket. Another um, great recorder, and this is probably the most used recorder in the amateur film industry, is called a Zoom H4. Comes in a nice little case. This is a two or four channel recorder. It has two built-in microphones and you can adjust the, it's almost like a, a directionality by rotating this to make the pickup narrower or wider. It has, I forget what they're called, but these are universal XLR and quarter inch connectors. So you can plug in either one You've got a uh, earphone jack to plug in your headphones. You can adjust the gain, start, stop, record. You can make different file folders and all sorts of things. It's uh, fairly inexpensive and it's pretty much a workhorse in amateur filmmaking. Now, when I buy equipment, I normally buy used equipment through eBay through PayPal. And the reason I do that is I can get what I need for, I usually aim for one third the cost. So something costs $300, I can probably get it for $100 on eBay. And I do this for, for virtually anything I need with the exception of anything mechanical, like a uh, camcorder that uses um, uh, tapes I would never buy because they do wear out. The only uh, negative of these H4Ns is they're, they're terrible on batteries. They go through batteries very quickly and it takes well over a minute to boot up. So if you, t if you keep turning it off between takes, your, your batteries don't last that long. Now in the kit, it comes with an AC adapter. So if you have AC available, you can run it on that. The other nice thing about it is many times when we use shotgun microphones or plant microphones uh, in, a, in a set, a lot of time you can use the zoom simply by hiding it. For example, let's say you're shooting a couple on a couch and shooting their dialogue. I could set this and let's say there was a, uh, a small table in front of them. I could set this under the table, point it up, press record, set the gain, and I'm ready to go. So these are these are quite handy. I use this all the time. Uh, another thing you should have is a battery tester. A lot of your gear, especially if you shoot in the field, is going to run on batteries. You're going to need lots of batteries. And it's nice to be able to check the condition of those batteries. Now the next thing I want to show you 
is my little accessory kit. When you're in the field or in the studio and you're using lav mics uh, or you're in the field, you need a few things. One of them is surgical tape. Surgical tape allows you to hide microphones like a lav mic on a person's body and to be able to remove it without removing the skin. That's a, that's a good thing. Extra batteries, clips for the lav mics, little windscreens. These all come in handy. That's another thing I recommend. One other thing, you know, we talked about decibels and, and how you measure sound. One of the things that's very handy if you use a two-channel recorder is the recorder has two inputs. I can set the gain of each channel separately. If I'm wary that, that the dialogue or one of the actors may suddenly scream or raise their voice, one way to protect yourself from having to do another take is to use what's called an attenuator cable. Now what this does, this takes the feed from the microphone and plugs in to both channels on your recorder but one of these plugs has some components in it, simple resistors, that reduce the level of the audio by 12 dB. And if you recall, every 6 dB is cutting it in half. So essentially, you're, you would be recording full audio into one channel and one quarter audio into the other channel. So if there was a sudden scream, you're probably going to go above 0 dB on your prime channel but you're going to be fine on your secondary channel. So when you're editing, you could simply insert this portion rather than this portion. Now let's talk about microphones. If you're doing voiceovers or you're making YouTube videos or Zoom calls or training videos, you need what's called a studio mic. And this is a typical studio mic. This is uh, not a very expensive one, uh, maybe $40. Um, I can't demo it because it has a USB to connect to your computer. What makes this one nice, it has very good sound quality, but it also has a volume control or gain control right on the front. So if you look at your computer and your signal's a little too high, you can simply turn it down or turn it up. Uh, one tip when you use these is this, you can't see by looking at it, but this microphone is actually designed to be talked into vertical. A lot of people think you talk in this way, but you don't. It has a diaphragm in, in it and it's in this plane. But this is not the best for recording a better way is to tilt it slightly and turn it slightly so you're hitting the ribbon at an angle. This gives you less distortion and fewer uh, pops. For example, if I said Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers, with many microphones, you're going to hear explosives. You're going to hear distortion. If you turn the mic, you'll eliminate most of those. Moving on to microphones, let's talk about the ubiquitous, ubiquitous, <laughs> the common shotgun microphone. These are two typical shotgun microphones. One of, this, one of these costs well over $600. This one costs maybe 60. And honestly, I can't tell the difference. What makes a shotgun microphone unique is these slots on the sides. These work just like the muffler on your car. The shotgun microphone is directional in that it's going to record sound directly in front and it's going to tend to cancel 
sound from the side. And the way it does that is sound enters these baffles and it has a slower, torturous path. And by the time it gets to the microphone element down here, it's out of phase with your primary sound. So essentially it cancels noise. So sound from the front, good. Sound from the side, bad. Now, when you use one of these, a lot of people don't use it correctly. What you want to do, of course, is point the microphone towards your source. If it's dialogue directly towards your actor, to your actor's mouth. But on the other hand, if you have a noise source, let's say there's a um, somebody, you're, you're in an outdoor set and there's somebody mowing a lawn out here. What you need to do is you want to sort of point the mic null so that the canceling portion, which is this way, is pointed towards the source. And still your the front of the mic is pointed towards your towards your subject. Next up is my oh, one other thing is the length of the shotgun determines its directionality. The shorter the mic, the, the, the broader the pickup. The longer the mic, the more narrower the pickup. There are some shotgun, professional shotgun microphones that are almost three feet long. Now, these microphones, most modern microphones that you buy can be powered either by an internal battery or phantom power that we talked about earlier. Some will work on both, but you need to be careful because some microphones, if they are designed to work only with a battery and you apply phantom power, you can destroy the microphone, which is not a good thing. Now here's my favorite microphone. I use this all the time. It's amazing what you can do with this microphone. This is called a Boya UA1. I, I'm not sure of the model. It's, it's very famous. It's all over the place. It's a very good microphone as far as audio response. It's fairly sensitive. It has a 20-foot cord, which means I could be wearing this microphone and I can still have movement. It has uh, an internal battery, so you can use it on with a little switch. You can use it on battery, or it'll also run on phantom. And, of course, it has a little wind screen and a clip to clip on your shirt. Uh, another tip is whenever you're dealing with these type microphones, which are they're called electric or electronic, always keep the windshield on them because they are very, very sensitive and fragile. By keeping the windscreen on that, if you were to drop it on a table or something, it's a soft cushion and it won't damage the microphone. Another type of microphone that you'll run across has been around for years and years, and this is called a dynamic microphone. It's not electronic. There's no electronics in here. There's no circuitry. There's no batteries. It simply has a diaphragm that vibrates when it receives audio, and that generates a tiny electric signal, which from here will go to the recorder or mixer or whatever. These are virtually bulletproof. You could probably hammer nails with them. They're virtually indestructible. Uh, they're commonly used for voice, for, for um, performers, uh, lectures, and so forth. Uh, the only downside is they're not very sensitive. So there's a, since there's no electronics in them, there's no amplification. So these work best with good audio equipment that has low self noise that are quiet, which sort of means more expensive. Another
type of microphone is what we call a plant microphone and it, it gets its name plant because commonly they're they're hidden they're used like hidden in a plant let's say you at a restaurant scene and there's a little uh, vase with some flowers in it you could put this on a little stand and hide it versus the uh, plant microphone sometimes they're called instrument microphones in that these these are the types of microphones that you would use if you're recording a live performance by musicians um, you might have one microphone for each musician or maybe one for every two or, or whatever they're they're a bit fragile they always run on phantom power so whatever equipment you're using has to be able to supply phantom power and they're quite useful. Another type of microphone is the wireless microphone, which in my opinion is overrated and overused. This simply works by way of having a transmitter and a receiver. This is the transmitter, your microphone plugs in, you turn it on, it talks to the receiver. The receiver is mounted near your recorder or mixer or whatever, wherever the audio is going. These, um, the FCC made a change uh, about eight years ago that changed all the frequencies. And so if you ever see older wireless equipment on the market, you have to be careful that you're buying the right type because if it's the older type, you, you can't use it. Those channels are now full of fire departments or, or whatever. So sometimes you have to use these. I always try to avoid it because you always run into situations. You get interference from cell phone towers. You get interference from traffic lights that now communicate by radio. Um, always all kinds of interference this particular model is, is moderate price, and I believe it has two channels. Some higher end have uh, 50 or 60 channels, but they're, they're expensive. I mean, this is probably 150. Some of the higher end ones that you see used in pro professional studios are hundreds of th uh, <laughs> thousands of dollars. Um, an alternative to using wireless is to simply use uh, a single one channel recorder or what I do quite often is I use a cell phone and one of the nice things about a cell phone is the cell phone has pretty decent electronics inside of it what it doesn't have is a decent microphone so cell phones are truly capable of recording high quality audio and there's lots and lots of recording applications that are available to you many of them are free but what you need is a decent microphone and that's where the boya comes into play you probably can't see this but it has what this is called a trrs there's four four connectors on this plug and when you plug it into a cell phone it directs the audio to the two pins that represent the microphone now what that means is you cannot simply plug any microphone even if it's eighth of an inch into your cell phone it won't work so it's got to be the type that matches the pinout of a cell phone which is the four four conductor and as a rule of thumb, uh, whenever you get involved with connectors, you want to make sure that whatever you connect to has the same type of connector. In other words, uh, you can have a, a TRS connector that just has two pins. If you plug that into a cell phone, it won't work. If you plug a four pin microphone into a two pin recorder, it won't work. So you have to be careful about that. Now, the next thing I want to show you is something to avoid. This was given to me. I'd never buy this. 
this is things that people buy all the time. They see them advertised on Amazon and YouTube and eBay. And what it is, it's uh, supposedly a shotgun microphone that mounts on your camera or camcorder and simply plugs into the camera or camcorder to record. Now, there's a number of things wrong with this. Uh, they're very inexpensive, in fact, too inexpensive. The whole idea, if you think about it, is mounting a shotgun microphone on a camera or camcorder that may be 10, 15 feet away makes absolutely no sense at all. You're never going to get good audio with a 10 or 15 foot path between the microphone and your talent. It just, it just can't happen. The only time this might come into play, I guess, is if you're filming a anti-pimple commercial and you got the camera right here. Other than that, it, it, it doesn't make sense. They're very noisy. And if you're shooting with a DSLR, which I, I don't like, you're, 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 you may pick up camera noise of the lens focusing and, and so forth. So these never buy anything like this. You're far better off with something like this or even the cheapest shotgun microphone if in fact it's right next to your talent. Another handy thing is this. This is actually a fisherman's vest, very inexpensive. And what it has is all kinds of pockets. And what I use it for, if I'm shooting in the field, I've got my H, H4 recorder, I've got extra batteries, I may have a couple extra microphones. If I'm forced to use wireless, I've got a receiver, I've got my headphones. And if you're out like on a beach, there's no place to put this gear. So wearing this vest, you simply put all the items in the front and you're ready to go. And lastly, what I want to talk about is the shotgun microphone, because regardless of what I say, most of you are going to go out and buy one anyway. This is a shotgun microphone equipped to use in the field. It has what's called, this is called a dead cat. And this goes over this to give you wind protection. So again, as I said earlier, if you're using a shotgun microphone, you want the, this end pointed directly at your talent as close as you can get and if possible, you want this part towards any noise source that you can identify. So this extends to, I think, 12 feet, and I can vary the angle. Um, it's got a, this is a, a, a better quality boom pole. It's, the cable is internal, so you don't have any cables that might slap in the wind, and it's got a XLR connector at the end. So what I wanted to demonstrate is it seems like handling a boom pole is pretty simple, but there are a couple of techniques that you can use. One thing I can tell you is a full day of shooting, this thing gets, gets heavy. You'll see a lot of people shooting like this. And I can guarantee you after two or three minute shot, your arm's going to be hurting. The proper way is to pull your arm in and to balance the microphone and simply move it with this arm. This I could do all day long without getting fatigued. So that pretty well covers the demonstration. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the recording process. Essentially, there's two common processes used in amateur filmmaking, and they are called single versus dual. 
Single simply means the mic is fed directly into the camcorder or DSLR. Uh, there's no mixer in the middle, there's no recorder, it's just a straight shot from the microphone into the camera. And in fact, it could even be the built-in microphone in, instead of an external microphone, which isn't recommended, but some people do it. It's very simple. You simply have a microphone connected at one end of the cable and the other end of the cable connected to the camera. But it's got some serious drawbacks. One of the biggest is how are you going to monitor the sound that's coming from the microphone? Um, unless you're standing with your chin on the DP shoulder, you've got to be right next to the camcorder or the camera. And if a gain adjustment is required, that's going to be difficult because usually you, you, you have to reach a knob somewhere on the camcorder or even worse, you have to go to a display menu and push a bunch of buttons to get to that point. So it's almost impossible to adjust the gain. And of course, using a microphone that's built into a camcorder or a camera can pose its own problems because you may hear internal noise of the autofocus and buttons being pushed. So that is the single system. And this is what it looks like. You have a microphone, you have a camcorder, and you have headphones plugged in the camcorder, camcorder to monitor. It's simple, it's quick, but it's got some, got some downsides. Now in the dual system, you're going to take the signal from the microphone or microphones and you're going to feed them either through a mixer, if you have multiple microphones, or directly into a recorder. And then you may take an output from the recorder and feed it to the camcorder or the camera. Now this gives you better performance in that the electronics used in DSLRs and camcorders is not that good. They're kind of noisy, so a lot of times you'll hear a hiss in the background, and that's simply they don't have the, the quality of components to give you uh, a, a quiet, quiet audio. So using the electronics in a recorder or a mixer is in general going to give you better noise performance. It's also much easier to monitor and to adjust the gain since you can plug the headphones directly into your mixer or your recorder and monitor the volume or the dialogue coming off your your microphone. And there are lots of different formats and features that are available when you use an external mixer and, and or external recorder. Now it is more complex in that you have more devices in the chain, but it does give you better quality audio and far more control. This is what a dual system would look like. You have the microphone me feeding a mixer slash recorder. They may be one unit. You can adjust the gain and you can monitor directly and you're feeding the same signal to the camcorder. Now, it's not quite fail safe in that you you're not quite sure what signal is going to the camcorder. You only know that the signal leaving the mixer recorder is okay, but you don't know about the camcorder. The way to correct that is to monitor from the camcorder. So now you know exactly what the sound sounds like that's going into the camcorder. You can still adjust the gain at the mixer, but you know 100% what's going into the camcorder. Another benefit is that if you really want to be good at filmmaking, you would have a separate video monitor and a separate set of headphones for the director to watch rather than the director being behind the camera, which is probably the worst position. The director sees the scene, he has no idea what's going on to the SD card or what the audio is.
but looking at a separate monitor and wearing headphones, he knows exactly what's in the shot and exactly what the audio sounds like. This is how it's done in Hollywood. The director is not standing behind the camera. He's over in a corner looking at a monitor and listening to the headphones. So he's seeing exactly and hearing exactly what the viewer is going to experience. So a lot of people now are shooting with digital single lens reflex cameras. And I'm not a big fan of them, and I'll tell you why. If they're older, they may have poor electronics for the audio. You may hear a hiss. Um, also, you may hear sounds of the camera operating, the focus, uh, pressing buttons, and so forth. And some cameras, in fact, some very expensive cameras, have a device called automatic gain control whereby they raise the gain based on the audio coming in. Meaning if there's no audio coming in because there's no audio in the shot, it will simply raise the gain trying to, to reach a level and you'll hear nothing but hiss. And some, some DSLRs, you actually can't even turn that off. The other uh, negative is they don't have what's called a balanced input, input or your your uh, XLR cables, so they're very susceptible to noise. And of course, most do not have phantom power, so you can't use any professional microphone that requires phantom power. So anytime a dual system is used, it should be slated so the editor can align the video with the audio. And of course, you've seen this a million times, which is the clapboard. They write the scene number and so forth. They slap two sticks together. That makes a very sharp sound, which is picked up uh, on, in the audio track. And also, you can see it in the video, video track. Now, if you have a slate, that's great, because you can put additional information. But you don't really need it. As an alternative, all you have to do is put your two hands in front of the camera so the camera can see your two hands and the microphone can hear when you slap your two hands together. You also might want to say the scene and take number which will be a lot easier for the editor to sort out. So let's do a quick review. We talked about how important sound is in your film project. We talked about the nature of sound. What is sound? We talked about the various job descriptions that Hollywood uses that you can emulate even if you're a single person. We talked about the equipment, the minimal equipment that you will need to capture good audio. And we talked about different scenarios on how it's done. So thank you for attending this seminar and hope to see you soon in another seminar.